We're live and recording now. All right. I think that means we're here. Um, let's get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening uh, to those members of the global community who are here with us wherever you are. and unceded territory of the Snanaimuk people. This land has belonged to the Snanaimuk people for millennia, and they maintain their cultural, historical, spiritual, and traditional connection to this place from one generation to the next unbroken. I acknowledge this territory, and in so doing, I acknowledge my responsibility to center and support indigenous sovereignty in my work and in my being. Um, briefly, before I introduce our panelists, a word about what we're doing here and why. Uh, this panel came about because I have looked long and uh, sadly at the differences between the ways in which my rage is read as a woman and that of my male counterparts in the workplace. Um, and I've got some emotions about that difference, but what concerns me the most is the ways in which it manifests economically, which is to say, if I express my rage or my pain at the ways in which my being a woman has affected my life and my career, I'm expected to express those things within certain parameters of civility and decency in order to be heard. Those parameters, of course, were not established by women or by people of color, but by those who've been in power for generations in North America. And so if I express my experience outside of those parameters, I won't be heard and I won't be hired. I will lose work, I will find it hard to get work. So this is a materialist issue every bit as much as it is one of justice and fairness. And when I speak with my colleagues of color, they report the same reality, <clears throat> right? If they discuss their experiences of injustice, pain, or cultural grief in ways deemed unacceptable by those who have never been subjected to systemic racism or to sexism, they are punished either directly or indirectly. They're labeled uppity or bitchy or difficult or a problem or dangerous. And that's enough to cost them big, both personally and professionally. Uh, so I wrote a little blog about this and it wasn't good enough. So I decided I needed smarter, better educated people who work and walk in the world differently than I do uh, to make more sense of it. And that's why we're here. Um, a note as I introduce them, all three of these people are PhDs. They have earned the right to be called doctor. However, they're also friends of mine and they've given me permission uh, to call them by their first names because my feeble brain will never remember Dr. Mittermeier. So um, uh, here we go. All right, in the order uh, that we met each other, some of us long time ago, Professor Tai Kavika Tengan is an associate professor and the chair of the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of Hawaii Manoa. His current research includes issues of Hawaiian sovereignty, militarism, history, heritage, culture, and politics. Ty's also been a cultural expert witness in cases of water rights, burial sites protection, and protection of religious freedoms for Hawaiian incarcerated people. Hi, Ty. Um, right. Christina Mittermeier is a marine biologist as well as an internationally renowned photographer who has pioneered the field of conservation photography founding the International League of Conservation Photographers in 2005. She's won way too many awards for me to go through, uh, but they include um, awards from the Smithsonian and National Geographic for her conservation photography. And in 2014, Christina co-founded Sea Legacy, a global nonprofit organization dedicated to the protection of the oceans, where I get to work with you a tiny bit. And then Dr. Matthew Sandoval is a professor of cultural studies at Arizona State University's Barrett Honors College, also a faculty fellow at the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy. His scholarship and teaching focus on the intersections of race, art, and activism. Mateo is also a union organizer, activist, land defender, and an apprentice in ancestral indigenous spirituality. Uh, welcome, guys. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and if anybody would like to take a moment to introduce themselves in a language other than English, the floor is yours. Ty, you want to start us off? Ikino, mahalo nui. Anoa ime ke velina ya kakoa pao ina hoa makamaka e kipa mai i nei ahui. 
uh, e no wao he kupa no ehu o Maui uh, ke ia manawa ki noho nei ma pā lolo uh, ke ia manawa uh, no uh, ke kūpā nei mai ke ia aina o Pilipili e aina e Pilipū na kanaka aina me na akua i ke awawa o Manoa uh, aina i Pulupē i kaua tuahine pā mai kamakani o kahau kani uh, no o ahu mai ahu. Aloha everyone. Um, just wanted to um, acknowledge my own aina, my my own land that I come from in Waihu, Maui. Um, though currently I I live in Palolo and at the moment I'm speaking from my office um, at UH Manoa. Um, we we invoke the place names uh, here Pili Pili is the the ili aina the, the small parcel of land that uh evokes itself uh the the sense of relationships in in pili which is that that way of connecting and it, it's a place for us to connect with with the land the gods and and each other and um, at this moment with with all who have come into to this room to share and connect with us um speaking from the island of oahu um in the uh illegally occupied hawaiian kingdom um, and we'll, we'll share what I can um, today. I'm very happy to do so. Mahalo nui. Thank you, Ty. I haven't heard that much Hawaiian since the last time I was home. That did my heart good. Um, Mateo, you want to take it from here? Yeah. Um, I just want to acknowledge very quickly that uh, I'm joining you from Phoenix, Arizona, uh, the unceded ancestral territory of the Akamel Odom and Pipash peoples who are still thriving here. Uh, I'm also in Arizona, home to the Diné, or uh, what are normally termed the Navajo, the largest, the single largest Indian reservation in the contiguous United States. I'm just uh, acknowledging that land and that lineage. Christina? I want to say, Sarah, it makes me so happy to know that uh, the beautiful words that Tai just gave us in Hawaiian, you can actually understand, and that blows my mind. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> um, I'm reaching you from a hotel in Fort Lauderdale, but this is not home. I, too, like Sarah, live in the unceded territories of the Cuomox people in Vancouver Island, and I share the same sentiments as Sarah shared. Um, mi nombre es Cristina Mittermeier. Uh, nací en la Ciudad de México y crecí en Cuernavaca, en territorios de la gente de Ocotepec, en el estado de Morelos. Y... Tengo toda una vida de estudiando las, uh, los lenguajes, los idiomas y las tradiciones y culturas de tribus indígenas y su espiritualidad en todo el mundo. Y hoy me honra estar aquí en su presencia. I'm really honored to be here today, Sarah, to share a little bit of my experiences and uh, the things that I've seen and I've experienced myself and maybe a few solutions on how we can make things better. Terrific. Um, thank you all for taking the time to do that. Before we move into some of the deeper stuff, uh, I'd like to start with a definition, which is to say that there's a lot of folks for whom this concept of decolonization is gonna be a relatively fresh and new concept. So in the interest of getting on the same page and owning our own perspectives, um, I'd like to ask everybody to just give a brief definition. I know that's a difficult, but the brief definition of decolonization uh, from your perspective. Teo, if you wanna start us off. <clears throat> yeah, um, this is a great question. I think for me, decolonization means a whole lot of things, but I would say decolonization is a process and it's specifically, it's a specific kind of process. Decolonization is an unsettling process. Mm. And I mean, unsettling in two different ways. First, unsettling in terms of undoing the kind of colonization we've been dealing with in the Americas for the past several hundred years which is settler colonialism, meaning that Europeans, whether Spanish, French, English, Dutch, came to this continent, not merely to extract wealth or open up trade routes. Um, they came to live and settle this land, taking that land through military force, removing or genociding uh, indigenous inhabitants, turning the land into property, resource, and wealth. So decolonization is an unsettling, meaning unplanting, uh, and restoring Decolonization also means restoring sustainable and symbiotic relationships between land and people, but unsettling in the traditional sense, meaning that decolonization should be unnerving, agitating, uh, enraging. 
in that sense as well. That's what decolonization, I would say, means for me as a, like a starting definition. Ty, do you want to pick it up? Yeah, you know, you know, I, I would really echo everything that, that Mateo said and also say for Hawaiians and I think for many indigenous people, it's not only the, the kind of undoing uh, of, of colonization and settler colonialism for those places that ex experience that particular brand of colonization. Um, but, but it, it's also opening up the, the, the pathways for indigenous life ways to, to resurge, to be regenerated and, and to be put back into place, which happens along with the process of, of decolonization. Um, but, but sometimes also takes its own trajectories. And for Hawaiians, um, we have these dual paths of, of seeking to regain control of, of some form of governance structure so that we can have better decision making over land, um, and, and other sources of life for Hawaiians. But there's also the other areas of, of cultural, um, and linguistic uh, resurgence, uh, relearning re the language, reconnecting and, and replanting food. I mean, I like that notion of the planting. It's it's not only kind of pulling out the weeds of colonization. It, it's also replanting our own foods that give us life that we're connected to through these longer genealogies of kinship. And um, these tend to be the the spaces where our Hawaiian term for sovereignty is ea. It also means not only sovereignty, but it's life and it's breath and it's rising. And so the, the ways in which Ea is restored to our people um, is, is very much the, the, the core of, of what we're seeing is, is both decolonization, but, but also resurgence of, of Hawaiian ways. Thanks, Ty. Christina, do you want to add to that? I, I do, uh, and then I want to hear what you have to say, but um, I too come from a country that was colonized over 500 years ago. And in Mexico, the experience of colonization is very similar to that of many other parts of the world where the, the teachings and the ways of the white colonizers uh, supplanted the ways of the indigenous people that had made their home there for millennia. And there was a myth that their ways were better and we're still struggling with the consequences of those ways. Because the the ways and uh, and you know education systems of the colonizers say that land is you know there to be exploited and utilized and developed and made profit of, and we're seeing the consequences of that now, and we see it in pandemics like the ones that we're living right now, and we see it in climate change and uh, you know the floods that we're experiencing in Hawaii and hurricanes and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. and so for me the colonization is acknowledging that the people who lived in the ancient territories that were colonized might know a thing or two about how to make things right. Mm -hmm. Indigenous people on this planet are the last people that are still connected to the operating system of planet Earth. And in the colonizer mythology, you know, they're to be ignored. It's still juju, but it's not. And so I think decolonizing is giving voice and power back to indigenous people to help heal the mess that we've created for ourselves. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys all for, for that collective definition. Um, and moving forward from that, it, I think sometimes there's a myth that colonization is an artifact of the past, right? That it mm. took place hundreds of years ago on the East Coast and more recently in the West and in Hawaii, um, but that it's very much located in the past. So. I want to speak a little bit about the ways in which colonization, particularly as it relates to communication, is actively operating right now. So I'm going to bounce these questions to you guys. Feel free to take them on a personal level. Feel free to take them on a cultural level, on an academic level. Um, but let's start, Mateo, I want to start with a personal cost, uh, if you want to go there. Otherwise, economic, however you want to take this. But the question centers on what does it cost to accommodate the standards of communication that are uh, available to people in this sort of dominant culture? What does it cost to accommodate that? And what happens if you don't? This is, uh, <laughs> that is such yeah. a fantastic question. I would say that there's a, 
<laughs> That's a lot to chew on, but I would say that the cost is quite high precisely because when you go back to your original point about how disempowered people are supposed to speak within the parameters that the people in power set, we can think of that in terms of we're forced to speak the colonizer's language. We're, spo we're, we're forced to think in terms of the colonizer. That is how colonization continues its legacy. That's why it's not a historical artifact because it lives in here, it lives in here, it lives in our entire relationship and orientation to land, the earth, water, etc. So it's always ongoing and the cost is quite high. I mean, we're seeing the cost um, just in terms of the eradication of so many aspects of our natural world, right? I think Christina would be able to speak to that a whole lot. But I would think that that's an immediate, an immediate cost. Uh, the other cost is that um, there's a lot at stake when we're asking disempowered people to, instead of speaking in rage, uh, that we ask them to choke it, swallow it, put it down. Uh, th that leads to a lot of biological harm as well. That leads to a lot of embodied trauma because you are not allowed to speak in your own language. Uh, whether that means actual language or just the, the vernacular of the way that you behave, you enact, you say the thing that you're going to say. So I would say that the cost is quite high by asking disempowered people to shove down uh, their feelings, their emotions, or to quell rage. Uh, and I would say that the rage that disempowered people, especially if we're talking about indigenous people, uh, is a justifiable rage. I, I think rage here, uh, I think of rage here almost that I hate to, to bring Judeo Christianity into this, but I mean, I mean rage in this, in the way that Jesus meant rage, righteous indignation, moral indignation. That's the kind of rage that I think that we're talking about. Ted, you want to pick that up when it comes to the sort of Hawaiian sovereignty of it all? Yeah. Um, boy, again, the, the cost, um, are just so immense and and you know as, as Mateo was saying this internalized rage um which for for many not only indigenous but but other oppressed marginalized communities is intergenerational right and, and again to your point about this not being just a thing of the past it's ongoing in part not only because the these processes of colonization are, are everyday acts of colonizing, but because of the, the pain that had to get suppressed and, and dealt with in other ways, gets also passed on in, in families and in the land, right? And so I think the, um, the we, we see the cost in, in the over-incarceration of Kanako Maoli, Native Hawaiians, who are only about 20% of the population here, but make up almost half the prison population. Um, you, you see the, the, the cost of Native Hawaiians as well as Pacific Islanders, Filipinos, um, other, you know, most marginalized groups here um, really occupying sort of all the spaces that you expect with not only highest incarceration, but worse health and educational attainment and socioeconomic status. And this, again, this always always kind of pointing at the people as the problem rather than these structures which have put them in this place is what creates these, these deep and, and profound hurts and, and, and real embodied senses of injustice um, that, that then manifest in rage and then manifest in all kinds of uh, circles of violence within communities. And so it's it's also the that cycle that within the Hawaiian community especially, it's on the one hand to acknowledge this rage and to give it a voice, but also to find other sources of, of healing. And for which us is about aloha and not, not aloha in the way that the world understands aloha as, as the, the happy, high, we're, we're the, the natives that they want to welcome you to the land, which again becomes the other source of rage is the ways in which our lives have been really just overrun by tourists and, 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 and machinery that, that serves tourists, um, but really a kind of aloha that is a deep sense of connection, empathy, and relationship, the, of care for each other and for the land especially. Um, and so in invoking that, that, that's helped to really, and re reframing what it means to have aloha for each other and for the land, 
um, has given another way of Hawaiians to to deal with that uh, both the marginalization, but also recognizing where they're not marginal, where are where they where they are the center, um, as Christina was saying, where we know these systems of how to be in place, and then can also offer that to others here that come in in a good way. Thank you for that, um, Christina. I want to ask you this question in a specific framework because. You work, we're talking, you know, about communication and rage, but <clears throat> you work in a visual medium. So mm. can you, can you translate this a little bit to, to me? Because in my experience, you've worked with uh, quite a few indigenous communities in very, very small, uh, with very small populations, very small remote parts of the world who might not have a voice. Uh, outside of it, not, you know, a powerful nation like the Diné or, you know, or the Hawaiians, but, but some very, very, very small groups. How did you translate this into the sort of visual world landscape and, and your representation with these, with these folks? Sarah, I've been thinking about my response to that first question for a while. So give me oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Then give me that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> In the identities that we all wear every day, and all of us have more than one identity. So for me, you know, in addition to being a woman and a Latino woman, uh, you know, I'm a photographer or, or whatever other identity. But I, I want us to imagine a moment, you know, the way we think about white men when they express their anger. And this anger is often seen as a sign of strength and a sign of assertiveness and a sign of power. When the same rage is expressed by a minority with one or more of those identities, if you're a, a Latino, if you're a woman, if you're a person of color, you are seen as cuckoo, you are seen as dangerous, you are seen as, you lose your credibility immediately. And so we are not allowed to express our rage and our anger in, you know, salary negotiations. For me, it was so important to um, try to fix something that I saw, and that is that people who have been colonized often have lost everything from their land to their language to their culture to their sense of community. Mm -hmm. And the most thing that they have, the most important thing they've lost is they've lost their power and their pride. And through my photographs, I want to be able to give back a little bit of that. When somebody sees himself or herself in one of my pictures. I want them to see that power because in regaining that power, they can start asserting their identity again. And we have seen it all over the world when there's leadership and indigenous and you know people of color stand up together, we have a chance. But um, it's that just small kernel of saying you are powerful and you have something important. Because the last thing I want to say to wrap this thought up is... Um, our planet is in, in, in under enormous stress. We really are in a lot of trouble. Climate change is really closing in on us very, very fast, along with these other symptoms of fascism and pandemics, etc. And if you were in a boat that was sinking, you wouldn't want just the white men to be the ones paddling. You would want everybody to be paddling. And so at our own risk, we ignore the voices of rage and righteousness of all people. Hmm. Um, well said. Thank you. And I, I do want to acknowledge that this is a giant issue and something that we're not going to solve in the next 22 minutes. But this is the beginning of conversations, right? And the beginning of, of uh, making these connections. Um, Can I? What is it? Yeah. What do you have to oh, say? Oh, yeah. I was just going to respond to something that Christina said that I, I just found very provocative. I wanted to tease out a little bit more, which is that Generally, when the disempowered, or um, however we might want to frame that, when they speak in a language of rage, that language uh, is put down uh, or avoided because it's perceived as a threat uh, or perceived as a threat of violence. Whereas those in power don't have to speak in rage, but can do violence without the use of rage, which is to say there's an incredible amount of structural violence which requi requires no rage whatsoever. Uh, treaty deals are not rage filled, but can do incredible amounts of structural violence and real violence. 
uh, policy, just everyday policy, is not by its nature uh, rage-filled, but also does in incredible amounts of violence. So there's not like moral equivalency between like, oh, because you're filled with rage, you're bad. And if you do something with outrage, it's therefore good. Like that kind of equivalency should have no bearing, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think there's also an argument to be made that many communities have been trying through traditional systems in very calm and considered ways to be working for meaningful change for a very long time. And they've made no headway. And so then what is often, what remains is rage, right? Mm. What, I, mean, I think in many ways you could argue that the, the Black Lives Matter movements of the past year would have been unnecessary if reparations had been made a decade mm. ago, right? Um, yeah. But when you, leave pe when you fire Colin Kaepernick for sitting down, which is not mm. a particularly rage-filled action, yeah. Um, then you're, you know, you're, you're chipping away at people's alternatives. Um, mm. But I, I want to shift this for a moment because one of the things I think that can happen, and we talked about this earlier, is the sense of the problem becomes overwhelming, which can actually make folks want to take a step away. So I want to shift this into solutions. Mm. Um, and I want to, I want to talk about it in terms of two prongs in the times that we have left. And I, I want to start with what it is that you think communities need from the communities in power in order to start dismantling decolonization, right? So we talk a lot about like, well, what if native people need to do in order to X, Y, and Z? But I think maybe it's useful to start from a place of flipping that around, which is to say, mm -hmm. <clears throat> what do you think, what, hmm, what do you need is a giant question. What are the first <laughs> two things? Where do we start hmm. with this? Um, and Ty, I want to I want to see if you can lead us off with those thoughts. Sure, I, I'm muting myself because I think you heard my dog going off for a little while, so he wants to join the conversation, but I don't want him to. So your I'll dog is to be... in his rage. It's all good. <laughs> he, he, he was pretty enraged. Somebody was outside, and he had to <laughs> he had to let them know, let them know not to come in here. Um, uh, yeah, thanks for that you know, almost impossible question, but I, I think the, really the answer, you know, really starts with seriously listening to the communities that are most impacted because many of them have developed very clear solutions and there's no one solution or one pathway forward for all communities. So it, it needs to be really context specific. Mm -hmm. I would say in, in the case of Hawaii for, for us and for many indigenous peoples, um, but I'll just I'll just speak for the Hawaiian context. Um, the the current moment of the the pandemic, um, coupled with an ongoing struggle, which has been really the the, the largest within our Hawaiian movement to protect our lands, um, which is the the focus on stopping the construction of a thirty meter telescope on Mauna Kea, which is the most sacred mountain um, in our lands, and um, measured from the bottom of the seafloor, the tallest mountain in the world, really. Mm -hmm. um, its sacred summits have, have, have really suffered the, the, the sort of rapid industrial development that, that um, has been posed as education um, and, and astronomy. But really, again, it, it is about a kind of certain economic engine fueling the, the desire to create this 18-story telescope that would dig 1.8 million Eight, um, cubic feet of earth um, out of the, the most sacred place. Um, and it's for, and, and that's sponsored by multi, you know, national um, institutes from Canada, India, China, um, Japan, as well as uh, the U.S. So it, it's for us rethinking this relationship to, to land and, and not to say that, you know, all development is bad, but really what, which ones make sense. They also respect the, these important sacred places, which are sacred because it's the, the source of our water. I mean, the Mauna Kea is also one of the largest aquifers on Hawaii Island. So protecting that is not only about certain kinds of spiritual beliefs, but for us, the spiritual is always tied to the natural and for proper ways of living in the world. So what what can we do in terms of those who have power to rethink um, 
what, what development should mean in terms of the, the lives and the lands of those most impacted and, and to hear the solutions that they've been offering. And, and part of the movement there has been to offer other ways of honoring that place and creating educational and cultural sites for reconnection um, that can be very international and can really produce all sorts of, of important work. So that's, that's one example. And, and there's a larger example with a, a movement here to, to imagine an Aina Aloha or a, a beloved land's economic recovery plan after this um, pandemic. And it's brought together many thinkers within uh, the state to, to focus on thinking of an economic system based on Hawaiian values um, that can help to inform moving forward. And so, you know, we actually have a plan that has been developed here specifically for what can best suit us um, in, in the island. And I would say those in power need to listen to these plans and, and support them, whether they're here or elsewhere, and, and to just rethink, to recalibrate what it means to, to, to be living well. Thank you, Ty. Um, Christina, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I, I have two thoughts. Uh, and uh, the first thought is one thing that we all can do is speak up a little more. Uh, it takes a lot of courage. You know, yesterday I went to a store and the guy who was helping me, a white guy, you know, was super rude to me. And I said to him, you know, why are you being so aggressive? And he was taken aback, you know. <laughs> and, and so calling people out on their aggression is really important. But also, I think we all do it just because it's the it's what we have been taught to do. You know, once you reach a place of credibility and a place of power as a person of color or minority, it's our responsibility to try to start dismantling the systems that perpetuate the problem instead of just folding into what's expected. And I. place of work and to the people that we're surrounded by, but also to speak, you know, to, to have the courage to speak in rage and face the consequences. Mateo, you want to hop in here? Yeah, I do. I mean, if we're talking about like, what can those in power do, if that's who we're addressing, like, I've got all kinds of things to say, really, like, I'm like, okay, solution, solution, solution. Um, I would say some of oh. that, <laughs> go, go. Uh, I would say that some of some of that extends from what Ty brought forward, which is like um, restoring indigenous lifeways. That can mean a number of things. Um, I would say immediately it means restoring a relationship to the land <laughs> that we haven't had under colonization, where land is usually in our colonial context, especially uh, in the North American continent, where land is understood as property where land is understood as wealth, where land is actually understood as a something as opposed to a someone. Restoring that relationship, that bedrock relationship, is fundamental to everything that comes after that. And I would say restoring indigenous lifeways could also mean instituting things that we currently don't have, at least in the United States context. And I would say that would be restorative justice. We operate a justice system in the United States that is bent on retribution first and foremost, as opposed to restoration. It's about uh, punishment as opposed to restoring. And you can look at, I mean, there are a number of indigenous communities all over the globe who use forms of restorative justice to make things happen, where it's about healing the community, including those who might be in power, right? Because oftentimes when we talk about... Um, uh, decolonial action that people in power might have the shivers that like, oh my God, they're going to come for my head or something like that. But that's only because they're operating with the sense of justice that they're used to as opposed to a restorative justice model. And there are indigenous, I'm thinking specifically of like um, the Quechua people or some Quechua communities in, um, in Ecuador who use a restorative justice model. If you've committed a crime in the community, you are brought in front of the community, placed in the center of the circle in which the entire community is there, and they begin the justice system by reminding that person 
of all the value that they have for the community, all the great things that they've ever done, the reason why they're such a valuable a member of the community. That's where they start. And it's all about how do we institute a system of justice that's about healing the entire community and the aggrieved people. Like if we could institute a, a system of restorative justice, I think that that would go so much further than, than just the justice system because it would percolate all the ways that we interact with each other. That's a really good point. And one of the things uh, that I think that I want to drop into this is the idea that when we hear expressions of rage, I think what our culture teaches us is be afraid, back away, shut down. Mm. And obviously when that has to do with rage that can hurt us physically, there are boundaries. But that's not an inherent human reaction. It's one that we've learned. Mm. I think there is an opportunity when somebody comes at you. I mean, let me put it this way, as a parent, <laughs> right? When my kids are freaking out, I don't incarcerate them. Mm. When my kids are freaking out, the response is, you're really hurting right now. What's hurting you? Mm. What's happening? And so it feels, you know, to me speaking as like the white lady in the room, there is maybe one of the actions that can be taken, whether it's at the, you know, at the government level, at the prison level, at the individual level, is when we encounter expressions of rage that we've been kind of taught to read as threatening, to short circuit that and go, hold on, if you're in this much pain, I need to know why and how do I help? That if we start to rewire that, then there's an opportunity to start a dialogue instead of shutting things down. Uh, speaking of shutting things down, <laughs> we've got minutes here, um, but I, I want to give an opportunity because I think Matteo, you brought up a really interesting point, which is that I think there is a reticence um, on the part of people in positions of power often to make things right, whether it's truth and reconciliation, whether it's reparations, whatever it is because they're afraid of the hammer coming down on them, uh, because they're afraid of basically being treated the way they've been treating others. And it seems to me that within indigenous communities, there are alter alternative models. Mateo, you just spoke to one that I think um, is beautiful and I wanna learn a whole lot more. In the time that we've got, Ty, Midi, do you guys have any other models that you wanna share from the indigenous communities you've worked with? I, I just learned about a, a community of fishermen in Baja California, Mexico, that uh, have worked really hard to restore the bay that gives them sustenance. And so they establish, a, you know, a, a, they plant the clams that they harvest and they have a whole system of monitoring and the entire community is involved in the governance of the resource that before was devastated because, you know, they had lost the sense of community. When one of the members decided to go on his own and poach the labor, the, you know, the fruit of the labor that the community had put together, they punished him by forbidding him from fishing for six months. But if he agreed to volunteer to do community service, they would lessen the punishment to only three months. Well, he did that and then he went house by house asking for the forgiveness of the community because in the end, being part of a community that you contribute to and for a lot of indigenous people, uh, wealth is not is measured not by the stuff you own, but how, how much you can give back to the community. Mm. Is more valuable and more powerful than having you know more stuff than your neighbor. So, I think reassessing our relationship to wealth and the materialistic and consumeristic behavior that has been handed down uh, through the process of colonization. Thanks, Ty. Yeah, thanks for for everything on the, this 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 great discussion has brought up. Um, within the Hawaiian context, one of the models that's been used um, as an alternative form of restorative justice is the Pu'u Honua. Um, and Mark Patterson, who, who was a warden at uh, one of the women's correctional facilities, really tried to implement this here on the island of Oahu. Um, the idea coming from our Hawaiian past or Pu'u Honua are safe spaces, sanctuaries, where if you violated um, a kapu, um, kind of certain Hawaiian religious laws. Um, if you went to a pu'u honua, um, you, you could um, avoid, there were penalties. I mean, some of them were death, uh, but you could avoid those and then enact a, a way of restoring your your place in society 
um, through work there at the Puuhonua. And the Puuhonua was not only a place, it could also be a person, a person mm -hmm. that, that, that could provide that sanctuary. And so this model has been brought forward as a way of, of re restoring our people um, against the, the violations that they've been um, kind of yoked with under the colonial system. It's also what was the staging ground for the, the stand against the construction equipment at the Mauna, at Mauna Kea, was the creation of a Pu'uhonua. And I know we're out of time, but I would just say that, you know, there, there's, there are these models that, that our communities and others are bringing forward that, that are shown to work. You know, and what's, thank you for that. And what I'm hearing actually as a through line of all of that is service that a part of making things better, making things right, tai ho'oponopono is the word that's in my head because it was one of the early things that I was taught, but this sense of making things right has to do with service for others. And mm. whether that's on a personal level, on a cultural level, um, I think that's a nice way to end with an idea that we can live in service to one another, we can live in service to the people we've wronged, we can live in service to the land. Um, and then we may be entering a time when concepts like that stop seeming like crazy hippie pinko kami tree hugger nonsense <laughs> and start feeling like rational policy decisions that are a way out of the mess of uh, environmental chaos and fascism that we're in. Um, so I want to thank you guys very much uh, for bringing your hearts and your minds here. I want to thank you, the people who are joining us now. Uh, I'd like to thank the people who are going to join us later when this is you know, put out elsewhere. Um, some of these concepts are new. And so you've got three brilliant minds here that the Harasses community can connect with through their profiles. If you want to talk more, if you want to learn more, there's resources. Um, but thank you guys very much for coming. Thank I you. It. We're in mahalo, very different. Mahalo, nui. So yeah, big thanks to everybody. And uh, we will sign off with love. Gracias. Thank you for our conversation another time. Yes. Ciao, y'all. Thank you. Thank you.